Okay, here we go. New recording. Hello there. This is chapter 11 of the By the Book game. By the Book book, actually. And this is Dark Passage. Okay, let's click over here on webcam and make it full screen. All right, well, yeah. Ta-da. And I'll get out of the way. I'll get out of the way so I could actually be in the picture. It's tight quarters here. You could, but I, it, this is actually easier at this point. Okay, yeah, it's nice being tall. It's kind of fun. All right, here we are. At first, Hawk was thrilled with the idea of defeating the kobold and bringing home a small fortune. But after a few hours crouched behind a water barrel across from Frau Junger's, Junkfer's house, he was beginning to lose his enthusiasm. His wounded leg and rib cage eventually gradually stiffened in the cold air, making even the slightest movement painful. To make matters worse, his lack of sleep was starting to catch up with him, and the only thing that was keeping him from nodding off at his post was the agony that lanced through his calf whenever his weight shifted. Around noon, the wizened, uh, oblivious Frau Jungfer slowly hobbled out from her house to sit on her porch rocker. She rocked back and forth for a while, rendering a neat ball of yarn into a tangled mess with a cheerful click-clack of her knitted needles, then slowly hobbled back inside. It occurred to Hawk that the kobold's attack might well be the only exciting thing that had ever happened to this, late, this old woman in decades. Hawk tried to imagine being that old. Adventurers weren't known for their long lifespans, but Hawk didn't want to live forever. Just to support his family, maybe get a wife of his own one day, have some sons to carry on after him. According to page 9 of How to Be a Hero, every girl wanted to marry an adventurer. Hawk didn't care much about beauty, as long as she was loyal, loving, and caring. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life arguing with his wife the way he did with his siblings. He wanted a wife who would respect and look up to him. And just to support his family, no, let's see, the, the best thing would probably be just to marry one of the maidens he rescued. That was a classic choice. As long as he was dreaming, she might as be pretty too, slender but not too frail, and she would definitely be dignified. Hawk had once teased a couple of Alpendorf girls into kissing him behind the shearing shed, but their giggles had driven him crazy. Hawk didn't realize he was asleep until a stab pain through his injured ribs jolted him awake. When his eyes came back into focus, he saw what had to be the kobold skulking around Frau Jungfer's house. The creature was quite small, about the size of a four-year-old child, hardly even a challenge. Hawk watched quietly for a moment as the kobold looked over from the dam damage to the house. Judging from the scowl on its face, it wasn't too pleased that the house hadn't burned up to the ground. Hawk tried to stand up. The searing pain in his stiffened muscles made him suck in his sharp breath through his teeth. The kobold whipped its head around towards Hawk its sharp ears catching up the sound. However, it appealed, appeared to have trouble spotting him in the bright sunlight. It squinted, turning its head this way and that, but its eyes never coming to rest on Hawk's hiding place. Unfortunately, Hawk was in much too much agony to stand up. He watched through a mist of pain as the edgy creature turned abruptly and trotted back down the street. Stealing himself, Hawk slowly got to his feet and began to follow. Wren made her way back from the magic shop towards the center of town, feeling half triumphant and half uneasy. On one hand, Owl was acting really weird now that he knew he had magic. On the other hand, Wren was pretty sure he wasn't going to be dragging her back to Alpendorf anytime soon which meant she had the rest of the day to do whatever she wanted. Right now, given the morning's events, what she wanted was an audience. She returned to the town center and approached Hilda's fruit and vegetable stand. 
You'll never guess where I was, she said by way of greeting. Hilda looked up from arranging what looked like shriveled beets and smiled broadly at the sight of her new friend. Fox, you came to see me. Oh, go on, guess where I was. Hilda looked around cautiously. The Aces and Eights Tavern, she whispered. Good guess, Wren replied with a grin. But no, I just came from that creepy magic shop. My brother Owl just found out he can do magic. Hilda's eyes grew round. You must have been so frightened. It was fun, insisted Wren. Hilda shivered and changed the subject. What else have you been doing? Al and I went out to the woods today to a place he called Arana's Peace. You went to Arana's Peace? exclaimed Hilda. And you did not bring me back any flowers? she pouted. I didn't have time to pick any flowers, Wren explained. Al was in a big hurry to get a piece of the fruit. Have you ever been there before? No, but my papa used to say that good used to go there when he was courting my mother. He would bring her flowers all the time, he said. Of course, now mama is dead on account of the curse, and father is no fun at all. He never goes anywhere. Hilda shifted her weight, looking uncomfortable. Then abruptly, her smile returned, even more glowing than before. So tell me about Irana's peace. Was it wonderfully romantic? The mere memory of the place triggered a feeling of warmth and joy unlike Wren had ever known. Huh, I've never seen anything so beautiful, she admitted. Hilda's ears twitched in excitement. I would like very much to spend the night there sometime. Do you know the legend? What legend? They say it was a beautiful fairy named Irana who was there all alone but believed in true love. So she put a special magic in the garden. If you sleep there, you will dream of your true love. And sometimes you will even learn how to find him. Or her, in your case. Did it work for Rana? Hilda's brow furrowed. Not that I know of. She hasn't found her true love yet? Hilda blinked. Fox, Rana died many, many years ago. Wren frowned. That's sad. I think it is romantic, says Hilda with a gushy sigh. And whether the, the story is true or not, the magic works. Mama dreamed of father when he, she slept there. I wonder who I will dream of. She looked at Wren expectantly. Wren shrugged and tried to change the subject. Hey, you haven't seen Bruno yet, have you? I saw him again yesterday, but I couldn't catch up with him. He went into the aces and ate. Really? Hilda wrinkled her nose. Well, if he wasn't there, you should stay away from him. Only really bad people go there. Mm, the tavern looked kind of interesting to me. What else do you know about it? Only that Berthold owns it, so it must be very bad. Hilda swished her tail uncomfortably, then smiled. Would you like to sneak out tonight and go with me to Arana's Peace? I could easily sleep away after Papa falls asleep. Wren tried to imagine a centaur being stealthy and suppressed a giggle. I better not. I wouldn't be able to get back in town before my brothers realize I'm missing and, and have a fit. Hilda looked disappointed, so Wren quickly added, I'll probably be in town for a while, so maybe we can go there some other day. Hilda's smile brightened. I think it would be nice to go there with you, she said softly. I imagine it looks really beautiful in the moonlight. I'm sure it does, said Wren, wondering why Hilda was suddenly blushing. So do you and your father live here in town? We live in a ho farmhouse just south of town. Most of the fields below the West Road are mine, Hilda replied proudly. I've never seen a centaur's house before. <laughs> I've never seen a centaur before I met you. Uh, maybe I could visit your farm someday. That would be wonderful, exclaimed Hilda. But you will need to be careful around my papa. He will get nervous when he finds out I have a boyfriend. A, a but? Ren stopped herself in time, fighting hard to keep a straight face. Oh, well, I don't think you'll have any problem with me. 
She felt laughter bubbling up inside her and quickly smothered it. Well, I'm, I'm going to go look around town, she said. I have to hurry so I can get back to the inn before my brothers realize I'm gone. Come back soon, said Hilda. I will be looking forward to seeing you again. Red waited until she had turned the corner, well out of sight of the fruit and vegetable stand, and finally let herself burst into giggles. And for, fortunately, as hard as she might try, she couldn't figure out how to laugh like a boy. There was an entire chapter in How to Be a Hero devoted to the chase. Hawk had memorized it and felt confident he could wear down and overtake any type of flight fleeing prey, be it a doe or a dragon. This, however, wasn't exactly a by-the-book chase. The kobold didn't seem to know it was being followed, for one. Hawk's wounds hurt too badly for him to run, so he tried to stay far enough behind the kobold so he could keep an eye on it without letting it spot him. He'd find out where it was headed, and then he'd corner it. It wasn't an ideal plan, of course. On page 27, the book had advised uh, aspiring heroes to use the direct approach, resorting to stealth and cunning only when absolutely necessary. In this case, however, caution appeared to be necessary. Hawk panicked for a moment when the kobold suddenly disappeared at the edge of the stream. Fortunately, it immediately reappeared on the other side. Afraid of water, perhaps. The little creature then trotted straight through the barren-looking farmlands into the southern forest. Hawk didn't feel like wandering into the forest, which he knew by now to be full of hostile life. But he reminded himself that putting an end to the kobold's menace would not only make him rich and help the town, but it would give him the kind of reputation that would surely, surely attract the attention of the baron. Assuming, of course, he could ever catch the stupid kobold. After an hour or of following the little creature through the shadows of the towering fir trees, Hawk realized he was totally lost. He also realized that the pain in his ribs wasn't easing as the muscles warmed up from the walk. In fact, it was getting worse. The bite on his leg felt raw and swollen, and he couldn't walk without limping. After another hour, Hawk began to suspect that the kobold did indeed know it was being followed. It didn't seem in a hurry to elude him, however, even as though it glanced back at him twice. Why wasn't it attacking him or trying to get him away by using its magic? The problem was that even if Hawk gave up on following the creature, he didn't know how to get back to town. He was pretty sure they'd been heading south most of the time, but in this thick forest, it was hard to tell where the sun was or how late it was getting. Finally, the trees began to thin out a bit and Hawk saw the kobold's destination. They'd come farther than Hawk thought. They were now skirting the rough edge of the southern mountains. Unlike the gradual rise in the elevation towards the north, the southern boundary of the valley was marked with cliffs and sudden upthrust of rocky peaks. He watched as the kobold entered the mouth of a large cave flanked by stunted spruce trees. Hawk paused for a moment. He didn't have a light with him. Judging from the kobold's large pale eyes, Hawk wagered that it could see better than he could in the dark. That would give it a distinct advantage. But Hawk had advantages, advantages of his own, his size and his sword. He kept moving. As Hawk started to approach the cave, an enormous goon stepped out into the light. Hawk stumbled back, swearing aloud in surprise. The creature was nearly twice the size of Otto, and clothed only in tattered loincloth. It growled, showing lopsided, decaying teeth, and dragged a huge club beside it as it approached. Its arms were swollen with rock-hard muscle, and dark veins stood out grotesquely against its reddish skin. Its breathing was loud and ragged, its chin wet with drool club, sword, size, speed. Hawk did some quick mental calculations and didn't like the results. He was limping too badly to run, 
so he'd have to hope that he could make use of his superior weapon to make up for his lack of size, skill, and mobility. Either that, or get very, very lucky. The moment he drew the blade from his sheath, he felt a strange calmness sweep over him. He took the initiation like he'd been taught. Coming at the goon from a Vuntag guard that felt like he'd been practicing it for years. He felt a sudden thrill of competence as the blade bit into the goon's flesh, drawing forth a roar and a light spray of blood. The thrill didn't last very long. As he drew back his sword for another offensive strike, the enraged goon startled him with a mighty bellow, then swung its massive club wildly. Hawk was forced to go back on the defensive, but he wasn't quite quick enough. He managed to move his precious blade out of the way, but took the full force of the blow on his right forearm. He heard a sickening snap, snap and felt a burst of pain. His sword, his beautiful sword, slipped from the suddenly numb fingers. In a haze of agony, all Hawk could think of was retrieving his weapon. He bent down and found that his right arm was no longer obeying his commands. He seized the hilt with his left hand just in time to hear the crack of the club striking the back of his head. Hawk heard a sharp whining sound in both ears, and something hot ran down his face. The ground tilted under his feet and smacked him hard on the side. Hawk saw bright sparks of light. Somewhere far away, he heard the satisfied grunt of the approaching goon. He felt himself relaxing, slipping into the darkness surrounding him before the huge creature bashed him into a pulp. No! Hawk forced his body to stagger upright. He vaguely remembered that he had hurt almost too badly to move before the fight, but now suddenly there, he felt nothing at all except an inner command to run, 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 run. Some remote part of Hawk's brain noted that the goon wasn't following him, but it didn't really matter now. Nor did it matter that his right hand was dangling at an odd angle and he'd probably never hold a sword two-handed again. Or that he was half blinded by blood streaming down his face. He only knew that if he stopped running, he would be dead. At some point, just before the world went gray, he heard the sound of his life trickling away, first in a tiny stream, then in a torrent. Then he stopped thinking altogether. When Falcon returned to the inn, he found Al sipping tea at the table nearest the fire, and Wren sitting across from him looking smug. Things have changed, said Al before Falcon could speak. Wren and I are not going back to Alpendorf. Fox, Wren corrected. Falcon just stared, surprised at Al's tone. What do you mean things have changed? What things? I intend to stay here, Al said flatly. I have decided to study magic. As it would seem, I have talent in this area. Magic? echoed Falcon in astonishment. His legs felt suddenly unsteady, and he quickly grabbed a chair across from his brother and sister. He opened a door just by thinking of it, Wren said, grinning. Falcon looked at Owl, who sat cradling his teacup as though afraid it might run away, and felt a sudden rush of understanding. As much as it hurt Falcon to admit him to himself, Owl had never been happy at the village. He had been shunned by the elders, pummeled by the younger boys, and teased by all the girls. And if it was true that he had talent for magic, that talent would be entirely wasted in Alpendorf. Owl. Falcon said gently. I do think you should stay. I know you will take care of yourself. You always have. But Wren needs to go back to Alpendorf, and I can't take her. Hawk has almost gotten himself killed twice now since coming here. Someone has to watch over him. Al slipped, sipped his tea thoughtfully. You say that Hawk has almost gotten himself killed, he observed. Is it possible that he could be credited for some extent for his own survival? Al, have you ever known Hawk to be afraid of anything? Falcon retorted. He survived this long on sheer luck. Why can't I stay here too? Wren interrupted angrily. 
it's not safe. Al set down his tea and looked at Falcon, tapping his fingertips together. As far as safety is concerned, he said, it would actually be better for us to stay here inside the town walls, as Red suggests, than risk our lives on a journey back. Falcon was trying to frame a response when he suddenly heard the bell tower chime out its third mournful note of the evening. The north gate had just closed. No one would be able to get in and out of town until morning. And still no hawk. Hawk should be here by now, said Falcon, feeling the first slow, creeping tendrils of anxiety. Wren fidgeted in her chair. Maybe he went to the Adventurer's Guild with another bounty, she said. He'll be here. It seems likely, said Al, but his hands worried on the rim of the teacup. There was a long silence. Hawk can take care of himself, said Wren. He always does. Another silence. Wren stood, Falcon stood up abruptly. I'm going to go to the Adventures Guild and see if Hawk is there. What will you do if he isn't, said Wren. She didn't seem worried, just curious. Falcon had no reply. At any rate, said Al, stretching, I have a great deal of thinking and planning to do, so I'm going to retire for the night. Shamin, who had been silent as a shadow next to the roaring fire, suddenly stood. Before you do so, young masters, do not forget, I need eight mon this night to pay for your beds and the fine food Shima has served. Al's brow furrowed over his dusky eyes. Oh, that is a problem. Hawk has most of the money, Falcon explained to the Fakata apologetically. I have only the five mond I made from making, working in the stables. He quickly pressed the coins into the innkeeper's rough palm. Hawk will pay you for the rest when he comes in. Shamin's ears folded slightly and his tail twitched once. As you wish, young master. Please ensure that young Hawk does play for the rest, or Shima and I will suffer greatly for the loss. I'm going to go find him, said Falcon, right now. If he didn't, Shimin and Shima wouldn't be the only ones to suffer. The last thing Falcon wanted was for his worries about Hawk to be justified. With Falcon off to the guild hall and Al shut in his room, it was an easy matter for Wren to slip out the window and head for the Aces and Eights Tavern. This time she found a hiding spot near the entrance and settled in to watch for a while. She wrapped her quilt about herself, letting her nose adjust to the sour smell of beer, and worse, that drifted out from the nearby alley. Surely Bruno would come by sometime this night, and she'd stay up here waiting to surprise him. Boo! Wren jumped. Even before turning around, she knew that it was Bruno. Hi, she said, trying not to look too embarrassed. I was looking for you. So I noticed he said, folding his arms. What's with you, anyway? Well, for one thing, she said, you stole my pouch the last time we met, so I think you owe me for that. I have no idea what you're talking about, said Bruno. He was flat out lying, but he didn't even blink. How did he do that? Renz tried to stare him down, but his eyes were smooth and black as onyx. Teach me to be like you, she blurted. A thief, I mean. Bruno's raised an eyebrow skeptically. Why do you want to be a thief? Why not, said Wren. You do it. It's fun to do things that other people don't think you can. I don't do it because it's fun. I do it because it's what I'm good at. Teach me to be good at it, too. Do I look like a teacher to you? Wren studied him again. Suddenly, her cheeks started to get warm. You don't look much like a thief, she said to the cobblestones. I mean, you certainly aren't smelly and scummy like the ones I've met. Are, are thieves the same thing as brigands? Bruno gave a graceful shrug. Depends on how you define thief. I mean, there's thief with lowercase t and thief with a capital T. He traced the letters in the air with one black gloved finger as he spoke. What's the difference? A thief with a lower class T is anyone who takes stuff from people. 
So a brigand, yes, kind of thief. But a thief with a capital T is more of a brotherhood kind of thing. There's an organization. Brigands do not belong to organizations. Do you? I practically run it. Ren stood up tr straighter, feeling thoroughly impressed. What about me? Can I join? Bruno rolled his eyes. Oh, yeah, I can just see the chief getting a load of you. He spoke in a falsely high, cheery voice. Hi, I'm Fox. I want to be a thief just like you. A sudden chill breeze stirred, kicking up trash in the alley and making Wren huddle deeper into her quilt. There's no need to be mean, she said. Actually, Bruno chuckled, he'd probably love you, which is what with that name and all. He thinks he's got a fox spirit watching over him. He's crazy. So will you let me join? Wren persisted. I'm great at sneaking into places and hiding. It's not up to me. Chief makes the rules. You're a thief. Why do you have to follow anyone else's rules? Bruno gave her a light cuff on the head. That's the point of a thieves guild, genius. The guild's there to enforce the rules. If you lose your license, you, you're prey to any other thief in town who wants to take your stuff. You do not want to piss these guys off. I didn't think thieves had to follow rules, said Wren, feeling a little twinge of disappointment. It doesn't seem fair that other people get to order you around. Luckily, it is not your problem, he said irritably. Wren frowned and stood silently for a moment, listening as a nice wind banged the shutters of a nearby building. Then she turned back to Bruno. I bet I know where the guild is, she challenged. Knowing where it is won't do you any good. You can't get in without the password. As for the rules bit, though, I kind of agree with you. But... You can get away with murder as long as you flash your license to the right people. Okay, so how do I get this password and join the guild and stuff if nobody talks about it? Simple, said Bruno. To become a member, you have to see the chief. To see the chief, you have to get into the guild. To get in, you need the password, which is only given out to members. Um, but to be a member, you'd have to... Ren frowned. Yeah, tough break, isn't it? Won't you help me? Ren pleaded. She saw something flicker in his eyes, and the lines of his mouth softened slightly. Then he said, what's in it for me? Ah, progress. Ren could smell it. I could do things for you, she said. We could be partners and steal everything in town. Bruno scoffed. You couldn't steal from a blind man. I've stolen hats right off of people's heads while they were asleep, she protested. I took a dress right out of someone's wardrobe and put it on a goat. I've done all sorts of stealing. Eh, said Bruno with a wave of his hand. That's a kid stuff. It's easy to rob people who are asleep doesn't take much stealth. Stealth is no problem, bragged Wren. I snuck up on a couple of brigands the other day and they didn't even know I was there. Suddenly, she had Bruno's fair attention. Brigands outside town? What were you doing sneaking up on the brigands? Those guys had cut your eyes out for marvels. Those guys were so stupid. They weren't thieves with a capital T. They were just bullies. They took my brother's book from him, so I had to get it back. Bruno's jaw dropped. Let me get this straight. Brigands took a book from your brother, and you stole it back from them? You should have seen my brother's faces when I showed them the book. The brigands looked pretty surprised, too, when they found it missing. Bruno narrowed his eyes thoughtfully. Well, you got Howden, that's for sure. It might even be worth it. What's Hoden? A sudden peal of laughter erupted from Bruno. It was a nice laugh. Hoden is uh, man stuff. Courage. <laughs> she grinned. That I do have. So what do I need to do next? 
You need to, I need to think about this, said Bruno. But in the meantime, if you see another thief, just do this. He put the thumb of his nose and wiggled his fingers, patting his belly with the other hand. Huh? Stupid thief sign, said Bruno with a roll of his eyes. I didn't make it up, all right? But it'll keep you from getting robbed or worse. Thieves can take care of their own. That's one of the rules. Wren mimicked the sign. Okay, I can do that. Now what? Bruno looked at her for a moment. Are you limber enough to touch your toes? He asked. Of course, said Wren. Dutifully, she bent over, splaying her palms out at the top of her boots. That good enough? Bruno didn't respond. Wren stood back up, only to find him good. Gone. That rat. Despite her annoyance, she couldn't help smiling. How does he do that? forest was gray. The spectral limbs of trees hung motionless under an ashen sky, and a silver mist swirled softly through the still air. Hawk moved deeper into the fog, lost and silent as a wraith. It seemed he had always dwelt in this shadowy world, where time and distance were meaningless. As he walked, a silence cloaked the fathomless forest. His feet sunk into the mist without disturbing the earth. He felt detached from his own movements, as though he were watching himself from far away. Heat and cold, pain and pleasure, these were but distant dreams. His skin was gray, his clothes were gray. He felt as if he were fading. Drawing his sword with a sluggish motion, he saw that even the rubies on the hilt were drained of their fire appearing dead and opaque in the haze. He sank slowly to his knees, letting the mist enshroud him. Then a brightness dazed his eyes. The mist parted, and he saw the maiden. Her dress, Irish blue, iris blue, shone through the colorless vapor like a patch of sky. Her moon pale hair trailing to the ground reflected a defiant ray of sunlight that seemed to shine only around her. She stood very still and straight with her back to Hawk. A fervent need to see her face drove him to his feet. As he drew near, she turned as though expecting him. Her eyes met his, and time held its breath. Gray eyes, eyes like steel, like ash, like a sky just after a rain. The forest had thrown away its greens to, to pay tribute to those eyes, eyes that would rend his heart instantly. How could he have not known the incomparable beauty of the color gray? Help me, the maiden said softly. My sword is yours to command, said Hawk, kneeling before her. The maiden smiled and reached as though to lay a hand upon his hair. Then she stopped, drew back, listening. Hawk heard it too, the mounting thunder of approaching hoofbeats. The maiden's eyes widened and her cheeks turned pale. A dapple gray stallion came charging up from the fog, tearing up clods of gray earth with its powerful hooves. Its gray-cloaked rider bent down to seize the maid with one strong arm and heft her into the saddle in front of him. The rider's hood fell back and Hawk cried out. Staring back at him was not the face of a man, but the snarling visage of a shadow-colored dire wolf he'd slain. The rider hauled hard on the reins, spurring his steed, and galloped away. All the while, the maiden looked back at Hawk her eyes mutely pleading as she disappeared into the mist. And that was chapter 11.